Hello, uh, I'm Will Haynes of the Watkins Museum of History. Today, we are very happy to partner with the Max Cotta Center for German American Studies at the University of Kansas and a number of other departments at Kansas on this very interesting uh, author talk with Allison Clark Effort. Um, I would like to just uh, make a few remarks about the connections between uh, our local history and the Civil War era, and then I'll go over some tips for those who would like to participate in the discussion for today's program. So as many of you are no doubt aware, uh, Lawrence, Kansas has a very strong connection with the, the Civil War era, both um, during the Bleeding Kansas era when um, this was a uh, sort of ground zero for the free state um, pro-slavery fight in the Kansas Territory. And once the Civil War broke out, of course, Lawrence um, was very much involved in that uh, very bitter and bloody dispute. And it's a story that we, uh, we tell here at the Watkins Museum of History. And of course, there are a lot of really um, excellent scholars out there, like to tonight's guest, who are doing excellent uh, work on the Civil War era. And as I mentioned, uh, we have uh, a special presentation tonight, which is a partnership with our friends at the Max Cotta Center. And uh, before I introduce uh, Lori Vanchina to do um, a little introduction of her own, I would like to just say that for those of you who want to participate in the discussion, feel free to make comments. Uh, you're able to make comments on YouTube and on Facebook. Uh, you're not, unfortunately, you're not able to make comments on Twitter, but I don't think many people um, are watching there anyway. Uh, so just make your comments and at the, uh, when um, Dr. Effort is done with her, the main body of her presentation, we will um, bring up your, your comments and questions. And um, I believe that uh, Lori Vanchina will also have some, some remarks as well. So with that, I would like to turn things over to uh, Lori Vanchina. Thank you, Will. I'm Lori Vanchina, Director of the Max Cotta Center for German American Studies at the University of Kansas. I thank Will for his support of this program. We are especially grateful to be live streaming this event, a first for the Max Cotta Center. We always welcome opportunities to partner with the wonderful Watkins Museum of History in downtown Lawrence. Indeed, we seek out opportunities to partner with the Watkins, the best way we know of to reach members of our wider community. I'd also like to thank the KU Departments of History and Women, Gender and Sexuality Studies for co-sponsoring this talk. It is now my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Allison Effer, Associate Professor of History at Marquette University in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Professor Efford's first book, German Immigrants, Race and Citizenship in the Civil War Era, published by Cambridge University Press in 2013, explored the German-American contribution to the rise and fall of white commitment to black rights. Her most recent book, Radical Relationships, the Civil War Era Correspondence of Matilda Francisca Annika, which appeared with the University of Georgia Press in 2021, was published in collaboration with Victoria Billich, Associate Professor of Translation and Interpreting Studies at the University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee. This fascinating volume presents edited and translated letters written by the significant German-American abolitionist and suffragist Matilda Francisca Annika and features Annika's intense cohabitating romantic friendship with Mary Booth. And with that, I'll turn the program over to Allison. Many thanks, Laurie, um, and, and also to, to Will at the Watkins and all the other units um, at the University of Kansas that, that pitched in. I feel very much welcome to Lawrence, although I am um, still here in Milwaukee. Um, I'll have to visit. I'll have to visit Kansas soon um, in, in person. I am going to ask Will to show my PowerPoint slides. Um, and 
I, I feel that I really do need to start with some introductions of my own. When you're going to be using people's first names and reading their letters and picking apart their personal lives, it only seems right to at least introduce them first. Matilda Francisca Annika was born in 1817 in Prussian Westphalia um, to an upper middle class family that fell on hard times. And she was essentially married off at age 19. It was a terrible marriage. Um, her, her husband drank to excess and was physically abusive. So Matilda spent several years sort of extracting herself from the marriage um, and, and extracting her baby too. It was very difficult for her to get a divorce and get custody. And that struggle to get a divorce in this um, really unhappy circumstance is what inspired her lifelong feminism. She, she wrote a treatise in... Um, in German, Das Weib im Konflikt mit dem sozialen Verhältnissen, um, Woman in Conflict with Society, which argued that the laws and the conventions that surrounded marriage enslaved, enslaved women, is the um, terminolo terminology she used. During the revolutions of 1848, she published a dissident newspaper in Cologne, and she became quite famous for fighting in the Baden campaign for a German Republic. Um, that's the image that, that you see that you see on your screens um, now. Um, she, she didn't carry a gun, um, but she had just given birth to her second baby within months of giving birth. Um, it's to her second husband, um, Fritz Arnecke. Um, within months of that, she donned trousers, mounted a horse, and she rode as an Ordnanzoffizier, a, a sort of military aid on the battlefield, sending messages and helping um, coordinate. So that was really what she became famous for. But the revolutions failed, um, and like many other 48ers, Matilda fled to the United States. She really had a very de difficult decade after she arrived in the United States. She lost four children to disease. Um, she saw her feminist newspaper, first um, woman-owned feminist newspaper in the US, she saw that fold, and she grew apart from her second husband, from, from Fritz. Don't worry too much. Um, she would go on um, to later open a girls school and serve as a founding vice president of the National Women's Suffrage Association. Um, also help form an all female section of the International Workers Association. But at this moment, at the end of the 1850s, living in Milwaukee, she had hit a real low. Enter Mary Booth. You see Mary Booth seated, um, and then uh, Matilda is standing um, slightly behind her. Mary was born in New Haven, um, Connecticut, and she was about 14 years younger than Matilda. She would go on in the 1860s to publish poetry and translations and other writing. But in the late 1850s, when they met, Mary's chief sort of claim to fame um, was her association with her husband, Sherman Booth. The name Sherman Booth is still somewhat known in Milwaukee circles. There is a Booth Street. He was Wisconsin's leading abolitionist at the time. Um, he was really famous for his part in the Joshua Glover affair. Um, Joshua Glover had escaped from slavery in Missouri um, and had made his way to Wisconsin, but then US authorities had caught him and tried to send him back to, um, to slavery under the Fugitive Slave Act. And Sherman helped rile up the crowd in 1854 um, that broke Joshua Glover out of jail and allowed him to sort of go on 
to to Canada. And Sherman was in and out of prison um, for that abolitionist activity as it moved back and forth through federal um, and state courts. As um, Laurie mentioned, um, I worked with Victoria Village at the University of Wisconsin, uh, Milwaukee, um, to edit and translate a selection of remarkably revealing letters that follow Matilda's life with Mary from 1859 to 1865, so really covering um, the Civil War years. I think the book should be a movie. It really should be a movie. It's the, it's the story of Matilda and Mary's love for each other. And it really, they face a lot of obstacles. Sherman Booth rapes a 14 year old. Fritz Annika um, is court martialed in the Union Army. The two women take, um, take three of their children and go and live together in Zurich, Switzerland, where they write and publish anti-slavery, pro-union work all the time. And nonetheless, they are poor. Uh, on top of that, Mary has tuberculosis. So I can really imagine the trailer for this, for this movie. Um, so in an unjust patriarchy with really poor health care, can their love survive? <laughs> It's, it's very much a Civil War movie. Um, it's a movie. You can see I'm thinking, I'm thinking in terms of, of, of movies with, with the dramas surrounding abolitionism and um, Fritz's ill-fated uh, military service. But the through line is really the relationship between these two women. It was not typical. Um, for two women to raise children together and leave such an extensive record of their feelings. But historians know about 19th century romantic friendships, specifically um, between women. This is not unknown. Um, Historians know that romantic friendship, it doesn't fall neatly into our categories of straight or lesbian. It could be really intense. Um, it could be erotic. It could be consuming. But romantic friends didn't identify as lesbians. Um, that's a category that really had yet to crystallize. It crystallized late 1800s, around um, 1900. So while the Victorian period, right, the, the antebellum, the, the sort of mid 1800s period is really famous for the veneration of the heterosexual nuclear family, um, effusive and even somewhat physical relationships between women were socially accepted in both Europe and the United States. I really value the, the work of scholars such as Carol Smith Rosenberg and Lillian Fadiman, um, and that's going back to the 1970s and 1980s. Um, but I am among the historians who feel that Smith Rosenberg um, and Fadiman underplayed sort of the sexual and the transgressive potential of same-sex relationships. They really focus on the close emotional bonds in a society where women spent most of their time um, in their sort of separate sphere um, with other women, um, which I think is valuable. But then you take that and in the hands of historians who are less interested or less nuanced in the specific, less interested in the specifics and less nuanced, then romantic friends can become sort of either just friends. Um, I've seen and heard that, that sort of idea of just friends, um, but in a weird kind of 19th century way, or they become, become kind of lesbians who, who didn't know that they were lesbians. 
I want to kind of go dive right into what seems to be an oxymoron, right? Romantic friendship. I want to face that kind of that tension, romantic friendship head on. Um, romantic friends refuse to kind of construct this line between the erotic and the platonic. And that leads me to believe we shouldn't overlook the, the sexual and the radical potential of um, these relationships. Many aspects of Matilda and Mary's relationship would, in fact, fit into quite well into a Smith Rosenberg's description of a really caring bond that grew out of and supplemented Victorian notions of women's separate sphere. Uh, the two met in Milwaukee, very late 1858, early 1859. And within a few months, Matilda had moved into the Booth household um, to mostly to care for Mary. Mary was sick. She, she had a range of symptoms, the most ominous of which was coughing up blood. And Matilda stayed up nights looking after her. Matilda, um, for her part, she was still reeling from the loss of four children, um, as, as you would. Um, and Mary, who had lost a baby herself, um, comforted her. There's, there's one point in the letters where they go to visit the grave of um, Mary's dead baby. Um, and they sort of use that as a moment to kind of reflect on these losses. Um, that, that Matilda um, had and to grieve together. And they really became inseparable. I think all of that, you could say, would be sort of just, a, like just, right? Like just an intense um, friendship. But Matilda and Mary's relationship shows that this mutual comfort came along with a probing of the boundaries of women's proper roles. When Mary first met Matilda, she wrote admiringly of Matilda to her sister Jane. Um, she said that Matilda had been in battle like Joan of Arc, so comparing Matilda to Joan of Arc. And then in a later le letter that Mary wrote to her mother, um, Mary said, Matilda wishes I could have been with her in battle. Um, and you can see um, on that excerpt, um, there are two exclamation points. Um, I think to me, that this statement to, to the mother, um, it, it suggests to me that the two have discussed um, Matilda's fighting in, in um, 1848, 1849, and maybe even sort of imagined how Matilda's experience in this masculine military realm related to their kind of relationship um, to each other. At the same time, I think that Mary senses that her mother might disapprove of Matilda and her unconventional activities. Mary insisted to her mother that Matilda joined the battle out of her love of her country and her love of her husband. So really emphasizing those things for her mother. Um, Mary misleadingly wrote that Matilda, quote, hates American women's rights females. Really, I really didn't know what to, what to make of that when, when I first saw it. There, there are certainly tensions between um, Matilda's very secular style and the more sort of Protestant um, spirit of the Anglo-American women's rights movement at the time. But by this time, right, like it's, 
even in the early 50s, the early 1850s, Matilda had already um, attended women's rights conferences on, on the East Coast and knew sort of the main players there. And then later, after, after the Civil War, Matilda would work um, more closely with Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, right? They, they're the two who run the National Women Suffrage Association. So my sense is that Mary is sort of anticipating her mother's disapproval um, by trying to distance Matilda from US feminism. I'd say in the same letter, these very same letters, Mary can't help but gush, I would say, about Matilda's beauty, about Matilda's achievements, about Matilda's um, the respect that Matilda garners from the people around her. For her part, Matilda wrote about um, Mary to Fritz. Fritz left Milwaukee in 1859 to head back to Europe as a reporter, um, and the two corresponded regularly. Um, so we that's sort of a great source um these two people who correspond um regularly to fill each other in on on their lives and matilda told fritz how much she loved mary she was always saying how much she loved mary there was plenty of talk of her kissing mary repeatedly of holding hands that they shared a bed um and that that openness i think suggests some of the sort of social acceptability of the relationship but i don't want to push that too far because fritz is kind of an unconventional guy himself um he had married an outspoken um feminist divorcee um and he had had intense relationships with men um earlier in his life and then also during the civil war um to a lesser extent uh, um, as, as well. In Matilda's letters to Fritz, you do get a sense that Mary is replacing him in some respects um, in, in, in Matilda's life. So this is a translation. This is um, Victoria Bilic's um, translation from from our book um, from a letter that Matilda sent to Fritz in the middle of 1859 so while Matilda is still in Milwaukee. Dear Fritz we should never have married we should have stayed friends and we may both have led happier lives and indeed we love each other more like friends now we love each other since we are most intimately related through the children we have together but we do not love each other like lovers who both feel that their desire for each other fills their existence and can only be satisfied by the touch of pure lips when they kiss my endless love for you was not able to convince you of this truth and all alone, it had to bleed to death. Matilda clearly had very high expectations of her relationships. Um, here she's sort of suggesting that Fritz had not been passionate enough. Um, she's blaming him. At the same time, she's sort of rejecting him um, and working in this very steamy imagery um, to boot. I, I think it gives you a sense of how Matilda regarded her intimate um, relationships and, and what she wanted in a connection. Later in 1859, Matilda's support for Mary extended into the quite public role of protecting Mary from the fallout for Sherman Booth's trial for seduction. 
we've sort of established already that Matilda had a clear interest in the politics of intimate relationships between men and women. Um, her experience with her first marriage made it made her critical of how women and children were slighted um, by traditional ideas of um, marriage and morality and the workings of the court system. So I was really interested in sort of how does this um, feminist react when an abolitionist whom she respects raped a 14 year old. I think the word rape is appropriate. Uh, on February 28th, so a little before Matilda had moved into the Booth household, Mary and Sherman had invited Caroline Cook over to their house to stay with the Booth children while Mary was off in a neighboring town to attend a wedding. Caroline uh, entertained the two Booth daughters and then went up to bed um, in the Booth house. Um, she she shared a, uh, Mary's room, which was separate from Sherman's room. She So she slept in Mary's room with one of the Booth girls and actually her own sister, Caroline's sister was there too. Sometime later, Sherman came into the room naked and got in bed with her. She said no and tried to push him off, um, but he um, penetrated her twice during the course of the night. Those are details that Caroline tested, testified to in court and Sherman and his lawyers never contested those core points of what happened. But the charge was not rape. Um, the age of consent in Wisconsin in 1859 was 10. And I think prosecutors did not see the attack as violent enough um, to warrant a charge of, of rape. They charged Sherman Booth with seduction. In Wisconsin and in many other states, um, Kansas, I, I'm not sure about Kansas, especially with the dueling governments, um, but in Wisconsin, um, a man could get one to five years in prison if he was found to have seduced and had illicit connection with any unmarried female of previously chaste character. I think you could sort of see the problems um, that, that this sort of um, charge is going to throw up when it comes to, to a trial. Sherman's lawyers claimed, and I'm willing to believe this actually, that he was only um, prosecuted because Milwaukee Democrats were looking for a chance to take him down. Um, Dighton Corson, who was the district attorney for, for Milwaukee County, was a Democrat who um, had recently served in the Wisconsin legislature. So he was quite, a, he was a political guy and he was a Democrat. And then Sherman Booth was a Republican. He was a radical Republican, right? An abolitionist who was kept trying to push the Republican party in Wisconsin in a more radical direction. Um, so, in another political context, I can imagine something like this being swept under the rug or perhaps being settled informally, um, which actually Sherman Booth tried to do. Um, he tried to pay off um, Caroline's um, father. Given the charges, given the politics, the trial was never going to be a vehicle for justice for Caroline um, or for the principle of women's power over their bodies. Um, and Matilda thought she was in a very difficult position as a feminist who cared about the abolitionist cause that Sherman represented. Um, and Mary was in, even, in an even more difficult position, right? She depended on Sherman, her husband, um, for access to her children. Um, theoretically, she would have depended on him financially too, but by this time, Matilda's actually um, keeping them afloat.
neither woman put Caroline front and center. But Mary was the one who had gone to Caroline's father and told him that she had seen Sherman in bed with Caroline. So Mary had come out and sort of made this important um, statement on what she believes is Caroline's behalf. And then Matilda worked really hard to ensure that Mary didn't cave to the pressure to sort of recant her statement. Um, Sherman's lawyers want Mary to testify um, that she had changed her mind or that she was incorrect um, with, with what she saw. And they really pressure Mary. Um, but Matilda stepped in so that Mary wouldn't have to deal with the lawyers and wouldn't have to attend the trial. And Matilda could be pretty intimidating. Um, the women also opposed Sherman's lawyers' efforts to, quote, hunt up evidence for him, for Sherman, against the girl. They didn't succeed. And I would say that the trial must have been really a horrible ordeal for Caroline. Nevertheless, Mary and Matilda and Sherman all continue to live in the same house. Although Sherman was often away in Madison, um, the state capital for politics, um, or, and then he was arrested. <laughs> um, so sometimes he was um, in, in prison. But that must have been a very tense time. Matilda wrote to Fritz, we are, we're a, we are aware of Sherman's good qualities, you and I both, but the evil instincts that lead him to seduce innocent girls you may not have heard about his lewd desires as much as I am hearing about them right now. He is evil in the true sense of the word. Despite those feelings, Matilda was prepared to help lead an attempt in 1860, the following year, to break Sherman out of jail when he had been arrested yet again. Um, he, he's very familiar um, with the inside of, of jails. He had been arrested this time for his abolitionist activity. So Matilda was prepared to stand by him in that important way, stand by him as an abolitionist. In the seduction trial, Sherman wasn't found guilty. There was a hung jury and they never retried the case. Um, but I think the larger lesson here is a sort of reminder for us to keep our critical, a sort of critical distance um, from people whose work we admire. Um, and I, I'm thinking here of Sherman Booth, of course, but also Matilda Arnica. I, um, I do, I'm sort of conflicted about her role and do feel that um, Caroline is the one who, who really suffered in this situation. may not come as a surprise to you, but Mary left Sherman. Um, so in the summer of 1860, um, Matilda and Mary take one of the Booth daughters and two of the Annika children, and they set off for Zurich, Switzerland. <laughs> How's that for a twist? Um, this is kind of, this is Mary's chance to get away from a husband um, who by this point she pretty much detests. Um, and she's lucky that she can um, take take her, her children too. One of them stays with her mother in Connecticut and the other comes with them to Zurich um, with them. On their way out of the country, um, Matilda stayed in Newark, New Jersey, while Mary was visiting family in Connecticut. Um, and we have a letter from Matilda to Mary at that point. Most of the letter is in Matilda's English, um, which is charming, um, but really quite difficult to understand. Um, her English was not that great. She never 
she never liked speaking English publicly. Um, she she preferred to work in German. Um, and in Milwaukee in the 19th century, you could get away with um, that to a, to a large extent. Um, so most of it's in English about arrangements. They're going to meet up again in New York City um, and sort of like passports and money and where they're going to meet in New York. And then Matilda wrote, burn this letter when you have half understood it. And a few sentences later, she switched over to German. I dedicate my life to you. Even if you have lost everything, you still have me. And my true love for you is eternal. And she ends, please know that no other heart beats for you like the heart of your Francisca Maria. They're about to leave Sherman behind and Matilda is committing herself to Mary. I don't think the burning reference is entirely clear. Perhaps Matilda was sort of embarrassed by her English and didn't want that sort of around for historians to poke into um, 150 years later. Um, or perhaps she wanted to conceal the relationship. And I'm thinking especially if Mary was staying with her mother in Connecticut. Um, I also think using German is a, it's, it's a bit unclear what that means here. Um, it, it could be that just Matilda didn't feel confident in English. And if she was going to be expressing these deep feelings, she had to use a language um, that felt authentic to her. Um, or maybe again, it's trying to conceal things. Maybe she thinks these opinions are, and these feelings towards Mary are potentially disruptive. Um, so either way, <laughs> This sort of, you get the sense of an alluring kind of secretive mode of communication that has a mixture of English and German. And I would add that they usually called each other Maria for Mary and Francisca Maria for Matilda. Um, Mary didn't like the name Matilda. So, so they use these names for each other that no one else uses either. They're sort of pet names um, for each other. The most explicit, and don't worry, this is G-rated. Um, the most explicit letters that survive um, come from Mary um, while they are in Zurich, while they are all living together um, with the three children in, in Zurich. They lived actually as a sort of um, just a explanatory comma. Um, they lived together with Fritz for a while, but then Fritz returned to the US to fight in the Civil War. So they briefly, they were in the same household as Fritz, but not long. Um, so this is a poem that Mary wrote um, to Matilda as a Christmas gift in um, 1862. It's a very sentimental poem that ends um, with Mary offering herself as a gift. So, I have but one little thing, scarcely worth the offering, yet this little thing I hold never could be bought for gold, not for all the pearls and gems in the world's bright diadems. Though it be of little worth, it is all I have on earth. It may not be found or bought, yet I give it all unsought. Take and lay it on the shelf, for it only is myself. I think um, this poem, um, it's, it's not really to my taste, but I think it is striking how Mary objectifies herself. Right. In a lot of um, in a lot of the letters, you see sort of talk of a spirit or a soul or a scent. Um, but here Mary is 
thinking about herself as something that could be kind of laying on a shelf, that could lie on a shelf. It's quite um, distinctive in that way. I prefer this um, little note, which again is from Mary Booth to Matilda um, while they are in Zurich. Pardon me, my dear, for writing you such a miserable little note saying I was unhappy. I am indeed very happy when I think of your sweet love. It glorifies every even and illuminates the darkest midnights. You are the morning star of my soul, the beautiful auroral glow of my heart, the saintly lily of my dream, the deep dark rosebud enfolding in my bosom day by day, sweetening my life with your ethereal fragrance. Dearest, you are the reality of my dreams, my life, my love. I have no more sorrow, I have you. My dear and dearest friend, Good night, your Mary. I think to modern ears, that sort of that closing, um, sort of using the word friend, um, potentially looks like it's sort of pulling pulling the rug out from everything else. That's so like, oh, just friends. But I think that a better way to interpret this letter is to realize that Mary doesn't think about just friendship. She thinks friendship is a huge deal. She uses all this very intense, passionate imagery to describe this relationship, which is the main relationship in her life um, at this point. So it's it's an interesting kind of what the way that the 19th century intensity comes up against our ideas of friendship um, and what that that should be. I would say, in addition to this, these sort of expressions of love, there were also some expressions of jealousy. Um, Mary kind of teases Matilda um, because she's been she flirts with um, Ferdinand LaSalle, who's an important German um, socialist who was in um, Zurich and, and other parts of Switzerland at the time. So that Mary kind of like taunts about how she'll have to make do talking to LaSalle um, when when they're um, out of town um, and Matilda has to stay back with the kids. Um, and you also, there's also a letter from a woman named Cecilia Kapp, um, who was a German, a young German woman from a friend, from a family that Matilda um, knew, um, who, who taught school in Zurich. And the letter from Cecilia is, is really sort of worked up. Um, she's writing to Matilda because apparently Matilda told Cecilia that they could not have a closer relationship, that Matilda and Cecilia could not have a closer relationship because Matilda didn't want to be, quote, unfaithful to Mary. Um, so there are these sort of tensions that, that complicate um, the relationship. Meanwhile, the women were very closely following the Civil War. They didn't think, it was funny, they'd talk about the Civil War with Ferdinand LaSalle. They didn't think he knew what he was talking about at all. Um, so Matilda and Mary um, published abolitionist fiction um, and also opinion pieces on the war for German-American audiences and also for German-German audiences, for, for European audiences. Um, they really pushed for the abolition of slavery to be a war aim from the very beginning. Matilda, um, Matilda had always seen violence as a good way to, to affect change. Um, she was pro John Brown, um, which um, people in Lawrence um, might find interesting. So she is quite interested in the military side of things, the military side of the Civil War. The, 
that sort of combination, um, as, as many of you are probably familiar, that sort of desire to end slavery and accepting kind of violent means um, led her to really complain about how slow Abraham Lincoln was in embracing emancipation. In, in March of 1862, Matilda wrote to Fritz, the divine institution will probably continue to exist until the last war, which the Negroes will fight themselves. That statement just really stood out to me. It's very apocalyptic sort of vision, the last war. Um, but it really does resonate with what we know and what historians have been focusing on more about how um, the influence of black people in pushing um, the cause of emancipation through their own actions on the ground during um, the war and then for through fighting in, in the Union Army. After the Emancipation Proclamation, uh, Matilda and Mary were prepared to stand by Abraham Lincoln, which maybe seems a bit unsurprising, but a lot of the German 48ers um, wanted to nominate uh, John Fremont for the presidency in 1864, right? So in the middle of the Civil War, many of the German 48ers think that they can have someone more radical as, as a Republican um, president. That, that, um, that effort was quite important in Missouri, but it dies out um, by the time the, the general election rolls around. The women also kept up with the interpersonal drama among um, German officers in union ranks, which I can tell you must have been almost a full-time job. Um, there's, there's lots of drama um, among these um, 48ers and other um, German immigrants who serve in the Union Army. They were particularly interested in Fritz, right? Matilda's um, husband, Fritz. Fritz had been an artillery officer um, in the Prussian army before he got kicked out um, for a duel, which was related to his radical um, politics. Fritz had a very high opinion of his own uh, military skills. And in the Baden campaign in 1849, he had been close to and even superior to um, many other Germans who would rise higher in, um, in the Union Army, in, in the ranks. So people like August Willich, Karl Schurz, Franz Siegel. Um, and Fritz could only think of one reason why these people were succeeding and he was not. There was a conspiracy against him. He was initially somewhat optimistic. He was commissioned as a colonel um, of a Wisconsin regiment, but he really wanted to see frontline action. So he resigned, he, expected, he accepted the command of an Indiana regiment, then he resigned again, um, headed off to Tennessee on his own initiative, um, and he served as a time for a captain, right? Accepting a position as a captain because he, he just really wanted to be on the front lines and do something important in this, this historical moment. Um, Finally, he was granted command of the 34th Wisconsin Infantry, which was stationed at Fort Halleck near Columbus, Kentucky, uh, which you may be able to see in the map on the screen. Um, Columbus, Kentucky was um, far west um, Kentucky, and you can see the Mississippi River, it abutted the Mississippi River, and the fort, Fort Halleck, was north of um, the, the city that you see, um, or the town, <laughs> the small town um, that you see there. So things came to a head for Fritz at Fort Halleck in the spring of 1863. Fritz felt that there were Freemasons among the officers who were in cahoots against him. Um, and he ended up insulting and uh, defying another colonel, right? Someone who was also a colonel 
um, Isaac Messmore, but Isaac Messmore was the commanding colonel of the post and, and Fritz um, insulted him. And for his pains, he was charged with mutiny and disobeying, disobeying orders. And in April, he, um, he wrote to Messmore's superior, the text that, that you can see. He said, I respectfully inform you that I, can know, that I cannot submit any longer to the exercise of petty tyranny, which has kept me now for seven days in close confinement, because in a private letter I have in plain English rebuked the insulting impudence of a man who, by chance, whether justly or not I, not, I do not know yet, is placed over me as a superior. To be treated in such a way like a criminal must revolt even a lamb. I inform you I shall break my close confinement and that I am ready to stand the consequences. So that's kind of Fritz's, Fritz's attitude. There are actually a few more twists and turns, um, but several months later he found a technical error in his charges. Um, so he left and he got as far as Cairo, Illinois, um, before being sent back um, to Fort um, Halleck and ultimately the court martial passed down a decision of military degradation. He was essentially kicked out. Matilda felt that Fritz had been wronged. Um, but she was also frustrated and embarrassed. Um, she wrote in May of 1863, your strengths and defiance should be directed towards things other than such miserable and humiliating quarrels. Disgrace triumphs and you come out on the short end. You always get caught up in such affairs due to your irritability. So <laughs> I have to say, whatever, whatever the claims of corruption, I would not have liked to be um, Fritz's superior officer. Um, relationships really do matter. But the movie really does have to end with the relationship between Matilda and Mary. Mary's health was rapidly declining and she believed um, correctly that American friends would help her pay for experimental medical treatment. Also, her older daughter, remember, had stayed back in Connecticut, um, and if Mary was going to die, she wanted to see her daughter again. Matilda was devastated by this separation. She wrote about that to Fritz. Um, and her response to the devastation was really to disengage emotionally. She didn't reply often to Mary's frequent, pleading, heartbreaking letters from New York. Mary died within a year in April 1865. My beloved Mary is no more, Matilda wrote to Fritz. Mary was the great love of Matilda's life. Um, the relationship was one of caring devotion and it had a passionate charge. It was erotic. Um, I think instead of thinking how we can fit romantic friendship into our categories of lesbian or straight, um, it's more useful to consider how we can use romantic friendship to really interrogate those categories. I, I don't mean to deny lesbians a history. I hope that they do claim Matilda and Mary, but I would argue that this was a queer relationship that predated the categories of both lesbian and straight. Romantic friendship teaches us that the distinction between the erotic and platonic is a constructed one. We don't need to see Matilda and Mary's relationship as the typical romantic friendship to see how it can illuminate the radical potential of romantic friendship. It sustained these women when men had failed them and it allowed them for a time to pursue their writing and activist careers together. It energized Matilda to fight slavery and to fight the conventions that she believed enslaved women. The relationship helped Mary and Matilda stand up to Sherman's demand that Mary side with him in the seduction trial and less obviously it helped Matilda bounce back from the ignominy of having a husband discharged from the Union Army. Our book champions the importance of relationships. They are not separate from questions of race, gender and class. 
and they make a difference in political and military affairs. Relationships matter. Thank you. Um, um, Allison, we have a question from uh, Penny, and then I'll invite Lori to ask any questions she might have. Uh, who is Fritz? I think I might have missed that introduction. And I think um, it would be useful to get a, a little refresher on who uh, Fritz was. Right. I sort of came, circled back around to Fritz um, later on. He was quite important in the revolutions of 1848. He um, was one of... Um, a member of the, the Communist League in, um, in Cologne, which was where Marx, Karl Marx, was also active. He sort of was in and out of the country. Um, he was always difficult, though. I think Matilda was right. He, was, he, he wasn't easy to get along with. So he, he kind of functioned quite well in these particular contexts so in Cologne and the working class activism of Cologne and then fighting in Baden. Um, and then things just don't go so well for him in, in the United States when these other German American officers are doing quite well in the Union Army and Karl Schutz becomes a US Senator from Missouri. Um, Franz Siegel becomes famous. Most historians would say more famous than he really deserves because he wasn't a very good general. Um, but, but Fritz, you know, Fritz, things don't go well for Fritz. He dies, um, young, he falls into a, a construction site in, in Chicago, um, in 18, I believe 1872, um, after the great fire of, um, Chicago. Uh, so Fritz is a, an odd sort of figure who, for whom he, sort of things don't really, don't really, I, I think he was probably disappointed with his life. Um, he, he thought he could do better. Lori, would Lori, you like would you to, like to um, chime into the discussion, into the discussion now? now? Yes, I would. Let me start by thanking Allison for a very interesting talk. I first encountered Matilda back in graduate school when I was looking at the 1848-49 revolutions and I saw that drawing of her on the horse wearing her hecker hoot. And you've added so much depth to my understanding of her role, both in the revolution and in the abolitionist and suffragist movements in this country. I have a couple of Civil War related questions that came to mind during your talk. Um, the regiment that Fritz commanded in Wisconsin, was that an all German regiment by any chance? It was not one of the sort of most notably um, German um, regiments. Um, the one, well, and he, he, he commanded those two different regiments, the one at the beginning um, and, then, and then the one later on. Um, and maybe that's part of the challenge was that he couldn't, quite find the niche where he was primarily interacting with um, Germans um, who, who supported him. He, he was sort of left dealing with Anglos who he thought didn't really appreciate him and, and what he had to offer. Although he always said that his subordinates really liked him. That comes to, <laughs> he writes these letters, um, he writes to Edwin Stanton, um, Secretary of War, um, saying, just like a really long letter trying to argue his case and trying to get the um, Stanton to overturn the court martial. Um, and, and he sort of says, these people will testify for, for me. I was really sticking up for my um, subordinates. It, um, so so it, it, it maybe, maybe my an, an analysis is wrong there, but he doesn't manage to kind of use his Germanness the way that um, Schurz and Siegel and Willich um, actually do. I see a question um, from, from Penny Hotchkiss. Um, 
did Matilda get involved with the suffrage movement in the US or did she st stay in Europe? She really did more in the US than in Europe. In Europe, she focused more on sort of ideas of marriage, uh, I was like, marriage equality, um, but meaning kind of like women having uh, a good place, um, a good, a fair kind of um, position in relationship to their husbands of fair marriage law um, and heterosexual marriage. Um, in the US, she becomes, after the Civil War, she returns to Milwaukee. Um, and that's when she really becomes a leading um, US suffragist. And she is, she, she's a vice president of the National Women's Suffrage Association, which forms in 1869, which maybe actually makes her sound a little bit more important than she was. Um, she was, each state had a vice president. Um, so she was the vice president for Wisconsin. She was the sort of leading um, woman suffragist in Wisconsin. And she went with Stanton and Anthony, who were upset that black men got the right to vote in the 15th Amendment without um, white women um, getting, getting the right to vote. I... I see um, Matilda as somewhat critical of um, Stanton and Anthony, and she often found that the Anglo-American women were nativist, were anti-immigrant, um, and were too much into temperance and kind of curbing alcohol consumption. Matilda really said, look, you're not going to get immigrants on board with this if you focus so much on, on alcohol. Um, and, and if you say really rude things, um, which, which they did sometimes, the Anglo-American um, women, sort of, why should this uh, man fresh off the boat get to vote and I can't, um, which is a sentiment you can appreciate, um, but it, it plays into that game of sort of, it's a zero-sum game, either women can vote or immigrants can vote. Um, so there were, um, Matilda often ends up being the one saying, hey, um, <laughs> remember, let's, let's stop and think about this and remember the, the potential to get immigrants to support women, women suffrage. Uh, Laurie, uh, Laurie, feel free, feel free to, to ask, ask uh, any, more any more questions you might have. Okay, good. Thank you. I do have one more, Allison. You mentioned that Mary and Matilda followed the Civil War developments while they were in Switzerland. How did they do that? Did Fritz write letters? Was there information in the popular press at that time? It was a variety of things. Um, they are getting news in the newspapers, in, and they're reading a lot of different newspapers. So they will specify, if you're really interested sort of in the spread of news, they, they um, refer a lot to the Augsburger Allgemeine Zeitung um, and other, other specific newspapers. And they're getting telegraph news. So the, the, these are sort of short little news pieces um, that, that are coming in um, by by telegraph. I need to actually double check the dates on that. Well, some, actually some news is coming in quickly. Probably someone in the audience could um, fact check me on that. Some of the news is coming in quickly, but it's coming in in a sort of haphazard way. So often we saw that, and you'll see sort of a lot in the footnotes in the book, um, sort of like, obviously she hadn't heard about this yet, or she hadn't heard about that yet. Um, it, turns out that um that fritz was also trying to earn a little bit of money on the side by writing pieces to appear in german newspapers about his experience in the civil war so sometimes matilda would say oh i saw your piece in whatever uh whatever newspaper um and, and would reflect on um reflect on that um it's interesting i think that well, there is a German language book that's coming out that deals with kind of the information flows and the publications, um, the economy of publishing um, during the, the Civil War. Um, I think it's an interesting subject. 
Thank you. Um, one more question, if I may. What, how did you come to this project? You mentioned in your acknowledgments that the Booth and Annika collections are at the Wisconsin Historical Society in Madison, but what was it about this story that caught your attention initially? Well, like you, like you know, um, people have heard of Matilda. She's not unknown. Um, and a lot of local historians have sort of told little parts of their story. Most of them have not been able to um, read German. And the handwriting, as you know, right, the 19th century handwriting, the Korenschrift, is is challenging even for native german speakers because it's just so unusual how they formed letters the standards for how they form letters um in the in the 19th century um so i sort of i knew about the story i also read a few of the letters for because it was very slow going for me. I read a few of them that were relative, relevant to my research on my first book on German immigrants and the Civil War more generally. And I knew Matilda just put everything in, in, in writing. She was a writer, she enjoyed writing, she expressed these strong feelings. She was also a part from Fritz um, and yet sort of took this the, the, her marriage to Fritz still meant this kind of co-parenting relationship, right? She had to keep them up on what, what, how everything was going for their kids. Um, and also she, she was interested in kind of Fritz's, what Fritz was up to in the Civil War, partly because it reflected on her because she was called Annika too. She was, she was Matilda Annika um, and she wanted him to sort of act in a way that would reflect well on her um, so I knew just from looking at a few letters that, that there was a lot there that was just sitting there that people hadn't um, looked at, hadn't made, made the most of. Um, and then I met Victoria Billich and she sort of, she, I think, and, and Walter um, Kampfhofner introduced us to each other. And I think it was Victoria who, who said, oh, we should, we should collaborate on something. Um, just a little, you know, we'll publish something on the side, a little project. And that was exciting because it meant that working together, we could really, we could work through these letters. We could decide which were the best ones and we could share them in a way um, that would, um, that would that would really be able to speak to people, I think, because there really is this narrative arc um, that the letters trace um, during this period, and I couldn't have done it alone, um, and I don't think Victoria could have done it alone either. Um, she she's a trained translator, um, and so she did the bulk of the translations, but. The historical context matters so much in these translations and just the sort of quantity and difficulty of the work meant that having two people uh, made a big difference. I see a question about, about the timing of when uh, Mary and Matilda left the United States. I think it was coincidence. I think it was more about getting away from Sherman and also getting to a place where Matilda hoped that she would er be able to earn money um, from her writing. Turned out she wasn't really right. I mean, they, they really struggled economically. They, they wanted to sort of have a middle class lifestyle and raise their children with sort of holidays and trips and music lessons, but they were really struggling. They were writing really hard, but it was hard to make money, um, money writing. So I think, yeah, I think it was, it was coincidence in terms of the timing. So they leave in the summer um, of 1860. And then Abraham Lincoln is um, elected in November, and then you have secession. The secession winter is um, 1860 to, through 1861 um, before, before the fighting starts. Allison, I have a question before we uh, wrap up uh, the program. Uh, to what extent were people of the era aware of romantic 
friendships like that between Matilda and Mary? And, and if they were aware of them, how did people uh, regard this type of uh, behavior? That's a tricky question because people knew that Matilda and Mary were living together and I, they were running a household together without men. Um, and yet I have not seen anything that suggests disapproval except for um, the sort of Mary's interactions with her mother about Matilda. That's the most that I've seen in terms of disapproval. Um, and you can see they had their photo taken together as if sort of like this, this isn't surprising that and we're together um, in, in some way. I don't think people would have, people did not use the term romantic friendship at the time. Partly, I think, while they could un imagine um, sexual activity between men, they couldn't quite imagine sexual activity between women. Um, that was sort of just not, not really on the table. Um, so it's, it's sort of a strange thing. People knew that was a really important relationship, but they didn't seem to see it as a relationship that competed with either woman's marriage, although it did, I would argue it was, it was, it was something that um, created tensions there. Um, so that's sort of why I insist on this being really in a category of its own, that, that rather than kind of try to squeeze it into our present day definitions, um, to really sort of accept that, that there are these relationships and some of them were less intense, right? There, there's um, just sort of like a lot of women had sort of really good woman friends who were really important in their lives. Um, that we sort of just embrace this as a specific phenomenon for the, the mid 19th century. Well, um, Dr. Allison Clark Efford, uh, thank you for this really interesting uh, presentation tonight. Uh, this is uh, a lot of information that I was not aware of. I see actually um, a question just came in from Flora. So I'll go ahead and read this and then let you answer it. Uh, I think I missed how the uh, Matilda and Mary partnership ended. Was it that Mary's illness and treatment eclipsed everything else going on? Um, fair enough. Yes, I think, well, it... It really ended because of Mary's death, um, but Mary had to leave Matilda for medical treatment back in the US. So um, this is kind of useful feedback to me to underline some, some of these points, um, but, but they had to leave each other geographically. Um, and, and Matilda sort of said, I, I'm, I'm to Fritz. I, I'm, I'm really under no illusion here. She's so sick. I'm not going to see her again. So maybe Mary sort of thought, oh, I'll just go back. I'll get treatment. I, I might get better. Um, Matilda's sort of like she's so sick. She shouldn't even be traveling. This is, this is going to be the end of the relationship. Um, so it was Mary leaving for medical treatment and then dying. Um, and so you see these sort of two endings of the relationship when they when they leave each other geographically, where they're geographically separated, and then um, within a year, Mary dies. Um, so, yeah, it would be quite a sad movie, wouldn't it? I had to have to find some way to kind of find uplift in the in the ending. Um, but but Mary's death um, at a young age is is quite sad, um, and I think it was tuberculosis, which today we could treat with antibiotics. Well, Allison, um, I know that we need to wrap up this, this program. I do have a question and it looks like uh, Lori would like to say something else, but you mentioned um, that this uh, story would make a great film and I agree with you. I just, I need to know who do you think should play uh, Matilda and Mary in um, the inevitable uh, Hollywood version of your book? I, I should have been prepared for that. I sort of, um, 
a Meryl Streep of a certain age, I think, would be a good um, Matilda Annika. Um, Mary Booth, someone, yeah, sort of. A, she was she was very funny. Um, so someone who could play sort of light and funny um, and yeah, I mean, I I maybe a young Renee Zellweger. Yes, you see, my, my, all my references are probably 20 years, um, 20 years out of date. Um, but yes, if there's anyone listening who, who wants to talk about this, I, 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 email me. Alison, on behalf of the Mox Cotta Center, I'd just like to thank you again for your talk and encourage you to come visit us in Kansas. You are, will indeed be very welcome here. Thank you Thank so you much. So it's much. been a real pleasure. And I'd just like to echo uh, our thanks for um, taking your the time to lend us your expertise and tell us this fascinating story. Um, on behalf of all the partners involved in tonight's program, again, thank you, uh, Dr. Efford. And uh, her uh, new book is titled Radical Relationships. So uh, we encourage you to get a copy and read it. Um, also, uh, I'll just say that uh, thanks again. And I hope that we can do more of these great programs partnering with the Max Cotta Center and our other partners up at KU. So with that, I'll just say uh, good evening and thanks everybody for joining in and thanks for the great uh, comments and feedback as well. All right. Good night.